guys it's the 23rd of May about quarter to 11 in the morning welcome to podcast number 30 which is the last podcast in the hermetic alchemy in the present hermetic alchemy series so this podcast is going to focus primarily on the completion of the great work which I call the last stage of the process. We've talked about two stages up to this point, and now we're going to start discussing the last stage of the great work of the acetate path in the Lullian tradition. Before we get started on discussing the last stage of the great work, I'm just going to recap in brief what we've discussed up till this point so that anybody who might be watching this without having watched the previous videos in this series will uh, have at least a basic idea of what, what it is that we're discussing here. So the first stage of the work the first of three primary stages is pyrolytic distillation or dry distillation or destructive distillation of a metallic acetate. Uh, usually in the acetate path work that means lead acetate but uh, ideally that's not essential Ideally, you could use any of the metals that will react with acetic acid to form a metallic acetate. Uh, Lead was chosen because it is the easiest to work with and it was also chosen for symbolic reasons. Pyrolytic distillation of a lead acetate basically means taking lead acetate, sealing it up in a distillation or reaction flask, heating it to the point where the molecules in the organic part of the lead acetate molecule, the atoms or parts of molecules, will break down under the stress of the heat that you're applying to the flask. And when they break down, they begin to distill or sublimate and when they begin to cool in the upper atmosphere of the reaction flask, those 
molecular ions or chunks broken off atoms, bits and pieces of molecule that are broken off the original lead acetate molecules will recombine and form new substances during the pyrolytic distillation. And generally speaking, when those ions, molecular ions, recombine to form new substances, they always form the same substances. But I say generally, because there is a bit of flexibility in exactly how this happens, and so there is some variation in the exact nature of the end product, specifically in the red oil-like substance that is obtained from pyrolysis of a metallic acetate. Uh, depending on the quality of your starting product, the amount of heat that you apply, the shape and size and volume of your distillation equipment, all plays a varying role on how the um, ionic molecules all clamp back together to form the new substances but we always get four conditions of chemical substances out of a metallic acetate dry distillation we get a clear volatile fluid we get water H2O we get a red oil like substance and we get some mineral salts coming over. Four specific conditions of matter, we might call these. And the ancient alchemists said that these are the four elemental, or most basic, states of physical matter, and that all things in the world, animal, vegetable, mineral and metal are composed out of these four substances and they said this because when we pyro, pyro, pyrolytically distill any substance animal plant mineral metal we always end up with these four products a volatile fluid water a red oil like substance and a mineral salt so that's the first stage is to make the metallic acetate to dry distill it and to collect the distillate composed of these four elemental conditions in a receiving flask and when that's been done that's the end of the first of three major stages in the work the second major stage involves cleaning those substances separately and then recombining them back together again until they form a single homogeneous chemical condition. This single homogeneous chemical condition is what the old alchemist referred to as philosophic mercury. The best way that we might describe what philosophic mercury is, is that it is a liquid crystal which is composed of a small amount of water, a quarter portion of acetone, a quarter portion of that red oil which is mainly composed of chemical phenols, organic phenols, and a mineral salt which has been volatilized through sublimation and these four substances are treated in such a way that they recombine back into a single homogeneous substance and what we mean by a single homogeneous substance is that if we take these four substances or conditions that have been recombined together again and we into a, into a homogeneous condition and we put them in a boiling flask and we try to distill each of those individual substances out of the main mass it won't happen the entire 
philosophic mercury will come over as one single distillation roughly at a single temperature so this is what the old alchemists referred to as recombining or wedding or merging these four elements back together into a homogeneous substance how they saw this condition philosophic mercury is that they said that it was the same as the original chaos from which the four elements arose but now all the impurities have been removed and those pure elements have been recombined so philosophic mercury is basically the original chaos cleaned and returned back to its original homogeneous state which is a liquid crystal kind of condition because it's a liquid crystal when it's warmed it becomes more fluid when it's cooled it becomes more solid because it's a liquid crystal uh, it's considered to be a solvent and it has very special properties so my last podcast brought us up to the point of discussing how the elements are separated, cleaned and recombined into this homogeneous substance, the philosophic mercury, and thereby, in my detailed explanation of how that condition is achieved, uh, where it originates from, and what that final condition looks like, the mystery now of the philosophic mercury is basically explained clearly in that video. So once philosophic mercury is attained, we are at the end of the second major stage of the great work. And one of the reasons why the old adepts considered philosophic mercury such an important subject and as such an important uh, substance to obtain and therefore they made a great secret of the origin of the substance and how it's prepared and exactly what it is they didn't explain openly and clearly because this substance has one important property which makes it unique in the world of chemistry or alchemy and because it has this one unique substance which I'm going to describe in a moment uh, it is referred to as a philosophic substance because it does something that no other chemical substance can do uh, we might say as far as the old alchemists were concerned because there probably are other chemical preparations which can perform the same task or electrochemical operations but back in the day the old alchemists insisted that this philosophic mercury is completely unique in nature and unique in its properties so when describing philosophic mercury the old adepts made a very clear and specific statement about it when they are referring to its most important property and that is that it has the, the ability to dissolve all bodies now people who are not initiated into the secrets of alchemy into the reality of alchemy take that statement and change it in their minds thinking that the change that they're making is innocent and uh, still refers to the same property but they're wrong they believe that when the old adept said it has the ability to dissolve all bodies they thought that meant philosophic mercury can dissolve everything If that were true, when we were preparing philosophic mercury, and chemists point this out, um, it would 
the philosophic mercury would dissolve the boiling flask and the distillation tray. So, and it, you wouldn't be able to store it because it would dissolve uh, the container it was stored in. But what they meant by philosophic mercury will dissolve all bodies is they refer to the salts of things, <coughs> the alchemical principle of salt. When a, a substance, plant, animal, or mineral or metal is reduced to its three principles, philosophic mercury can dissolve those salts in a very special way. And th that special way is referred to as radical dissolution. What that means is philosophic mercury, if you put mineral or metallic salts into philosophic mercury, for example, it will reduce those salts into such a condition that those salts will lose their chemical properties. So <clears throat> if we did uh, gas chromatography, for example, to analyse a substance that had been dissolved in philosophic mercury, uh, the chemical analysis would not recognise that substance because it is condition of matter that doesn't exist in the uh, chemical canon, if you will. Now because of this unusual property, because philosophic mercury, if you place mineral or metallic salts into it to be dissolved, it will reduce those salts into a condition which is no longer part of the chemical properties of that mineral or metal. What you end up with is a condition which is like an oil. And I refer to these particular uh, alchemical oils as oils of the first, pardon me, as oils of the third order. They are the highest condition or state in the pharmacology of alchemy uh, where oils that are produced spagorically are concerned. And they are the highest condition and property because they are produced by dissolving them with philosophic mercury and therefore they lose their normal metallic or mineral properties and become a special kind of an oil. Now, the important thing about this property, well, let me first say, if you follow what you believe are the instructions for making philosophic mercury, and then you try and use that philosophic mercury to dissolve substances, particularly mineral and metallic salts, and those substances still retain their metallic or mineral properties, the thing that you have believed is philosophic mercury is not philosophic mercury. This is the test to make sure that you have the correct substance. This property is important because if we don't obtain philosophic mercury, we can't begin the third and last major stage of the great work. Because the last third major stage of the great work is to take pure silver and or pure gold, reduce them to salts, and then dissolve them in philosophic mercury. And that philosophic mercury will change the nature of that silver and gold and produce what the old adepts referred to as the seed or sperm of silver and gold. What they meant by that statement and the use of that terminology is that these philosophically dissolved substances now have the special property that they can impregnate other base metals and convert them into silver and gold. 
because they are like sperm or seed. This, in other words, is the active ingredient in a transmutation agent. And they referred to this active ingredient as the ferment of silver and the ferment of gold. So the way that the old adepts looked at the situation and explained it was that the properties of philosophic mercury originate from the original chaos, which is the source of all reality, that those properties act upon silver and gold in such a way that they retrograde or reverse engineer the chemical condition of silver and gold back to the original or primordial chemical state of those metals, which they refer to as the seed or the sperm of silver and gold. So this is the beginning of the final stage of the great work, the production of the ferment of silver, which will produce a stone that will allow us to transmute base metals into silver, or in actual fact into any white metal, such as platinum, and the ferment of gold, which will allow us to produce a transmutation agent that can transmute any base metal into gold. Without these two substances, there is no transmutation to the white or to the red. This is why most of the old adepts, in fact virtually all of them, never discussed the subject of the ferment of gold and the ferment of silver. Almost the only way they discussed these substances or conditions or properties of metallic nature was in the discussion of what's called potable gold, which means edible or ingestible gold. There's a lot of mythology and a lot of complete rubbish spoken about the subject and a lot of people who get involved in laboratory alchemy really want to believe that they know how potable gold is made and then advertise that in public or in the bounds of the alchemical community as a kind of attempt at showing off that they know how to produce an important alchemical product. But true potable gold is what we have been discussing up until this point. It is the ferment of gold. It is pure gold, metal, chemical gold, that has been dissolved by philosophic mercury in order to produce a gold oil that no longer has the chemical properties of gold. And it is only by producing the oil of gold in this way that ingesting that substance will bring about a reaction in the individual in line with the kinds of descriptions that we see from the old adepts in classic alchemical literature. And they are things such as the opening of psychic faculties, the rejuvenation of the body, and the cleansing and purification, the cathartic cleansing and purification of the individual psyche. The old adepts describe the ferment of gold, the true potable gold, as being the only alchemical substance which is next to and almost the same in its effect as the elixir of life itself. So people who are producing what they call potable gold 
by chemical means, which usually means reducing gold to a powder by dissolving it with aqua regia, and then processing the result of that chemical dissolution with alcohol and acetone in order to produce an extract of gold. People who call this potable gold and pass it around and sell it in public have either no idea what they're talking about or they know the truth and they are duping people. Because if you read old classic texts on laboratory alchemy, almost in any place where the true potable gold is discussed, the adept will also often mention um, the fake versions of potable gold, such as that which is produced by the use of aqua regia. And one of the ways that that's discussed is, there's a little axiom or a, a sort of a poetic saying that the old adepts used, that we do not dissolve our gold with corrosive solvents. In other words, with strong mineral acids such as aqua regia, we dissolve our gold with philosophic mercury, or they use some other symbolic name for philosophic mercury. Um, in order to point out that there is a primarily uh, a primary difference in the two approaches, corrosive acids such as aqua regia burn and destroy the metal and remove its life. In other words, what they meant by that is its esoteric properties that uh, produce spiritual effects when ingested by a human being. Corrosive solvents destroy those properties in gold, whereas philosophic mercury not only nurtures those esoteric properties of a metal, it enhances them depending on um, the way in which the dissolution to a ferment is carried out. This is all very important information because there are a lot of shysters in the public who are conning people and taking their money and there are a lot of people who are produce, producing this fake kind of um, oil of gold with the use of corrosives at the expense of the ignorance of people who have not been initiated into the proper understanding of alchemy and the general public. So it's important to understand the nature of these ideas and what they really mean and how to tell the difference between the garbage and the truth of the matter so that you don't fall into the hands of people who are robbing you of your money or finding yourself in a position of ingesting substances which can poison you or injure you or at worst could have a fatal effect because ingesting these rubbish substances that are produced by puffers, people who aren't initiates in the alchemical tradition but who claim to be alchemists or students of alchemy when they're not at all, they're not performing any act that is alchemical, what they're doing is messing with borderline chemistry, alternative chemistry. Um, it's important to understand who these kinds of people are and what it is that they're doing and what it is that they lack in understanding. The truth is that actual alchemy, the philosophic level of alchemy where things are behaving in a way beyond the conventional level and known boundaries of chemistry, philosophic alchemy is still largely a mystery. It's a secret and it's handed down by people who 
have done their due diligence in study, have been trained by somebody who knows and understands, and who themselves have experienced the effects of ingesting real philosophic substances that alter their body chemistry and their psychology. So the ferment of silver and the ferment of gold are the active properties of transmutation. But by themselves they can't produce the desired effect of transmutation. What I call alchemical transmutation under ambient conditions in high volume. <clears throat> we need to have, in order for a, a, a transmutation to be real and effective, and to come under the category of alchemical transmutation, it has to be done under ambient conditions. In other words, you could do it on your stovetop in your kitchen. You don't need technical equipment or unusual conditions in order to make this happen. And also the transmutation has to be high volume. Making a tiny bit of gold with a small transmutation agent is not alchemy. Proper alchemical transmutation is producing large volumes of gold from a very small transmutation agent. So the ferment of gold and silver by themselves are not enough. They have to be um, united with their proper vehicle, which is the salt principle, alchemical principle of salt, which was produced right at the beginning um, of the pyrolytic distillation, and it looks like a sooty black powder. That salt has to be calcined or heated at very high temperature in a glass maker's or a potter's furnace until it becomes white and then it has to undergo a special process which allows that salt to volatize to sublimate and become a volatile salt and then that salt is united with the ferment and the two of them are digested together until they form an homogeneous condition and the way that all of this is achieved is through the agency of philosophic mercury. Philosophic mercury is the key tool in the uh, arsenal of the alchemist for ach achieving everything beyond chemistry, beyond the bounds of known chemistry. As soon as we start, as soon as we produce philosophic mercury and as soon as we start using it, we uh, then and only then are we in the realm of true alchemy and true philosophic chemistry. Everything before that stage is known about by modern chemistry. So the ferment to the redstone, the ferment of gold, is wed with the calcined salt principle and the two are digested and heated in a special kind of flask known as a philosophic egg or a chimere and uh, it passes through a number of stages of putrefaction starting off by turning black and then changing into various colors and then the substance vitrifies or becomes glass-like and finally becomes red and then purple and at that stage the uh, ripeness of the stone is complete. And there are only two other subjects after understanding that much that are important and that is the multiplication of the stone and projection which is performing transmutation itself. All I will say about the multiplication of the stone is that when the stone is initially produced, its transmutation power is relatively weak, usually, depending on how you got to that point and how skillful of a lab worker you are. But you can enhance the effect of that stone 
simply by re-dissolving it in more of the original red oil and clear volatile acetone and re-digesting it and every time you do this and bring the stone back to a vitrified condition through through stages of putrefaction uh, the transmuting capability of the stone is increased um, many fold each time until we're talking about the stone being able to transmute thousands of times its own weight of base metals into gold so this is the whole story all the complicated books that are written all the weird language all the labyrinth of terminology it's all designed to hide the information which I have presented in the last few podcasts the reality is very simple and the reason why I recommend Ripley's bosom book as a good beginning place for study is because Ripley's bosom book strips away all the rubbish and presents the entire process in very simple language almost with no encryption or vagueness at all he even shows us what the various classic cipher terms for the various substances and operations what they really mean then if we take what Ripley has written in simple clear language in his book and compare it to the books of other alchemists who have written on the acetate path we will find that Ripley's bosom book helps us understand what these other people are saying when they're being vague of most importance is Samuel Norton's books because Samuel Norton was a student of Ripley's in fact his grandfather trained with Ripley and so in their family was a very intimate knowledge of Ripley's method his language, his understanding, and Norton very carefully uncovers all the secrets about Ripley's other books and how to understand them and about the acetate path in general. Together, the, these two authors, Ripley and Norton, at least from our perspective in modern times are the clearest most complete most accurate description of the most ancient method for producing the philosopher's stone not only most ancient but also the simplest method so with that my series on hermetic alchemy that is my discussion on the acetate path of alchemy is complete and the podcast after this one starting with podcast 31 will now concentrate on the truth about hermetic initiation and I think I'm going to end up stepping on a lot of toes because I'm going to say a lot of things which people don't want to believe because they want hermetic initiation to be simple and stupid so that they can claim to be a part of it when in fact they are not involved in true hermetic initiation at all so that should be interesting beginning with podcast 31 I'll be discussing the details of the reality about authentic hermetic initiation Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you hopefully in the next podcast and the next series of podcasts.
So having finished this particular podcast and the full series, I know that there are going to be some people who are going to get a little bit grumpy because I didn't give enough practical information in this last podcast on the acetate path. But I can tell you this. If you're not clever enough to get to Philosophic Mercury, with all the detailed discussion of it I've given up until this point, nothing that I would say about what's required from the last stage, the third and last stage of the work, will serve you any good at all. If you're clever enough to get to Philosophic Mercury, everything else will become very clear and obvious. So, I understand that I may not have said as much as some people will have liked in this podcast, but I've already said far too much for the public realm. And one of the reasons why I've done this is I believe we're in a time now where the bullshit has got to stop. There are far too many people making all kinds of claims that have nothing to do with alchemy under the banner of alchemy. And it's time to get the record straight. <laughs>